Hello and welcome to everybody who's joined us today for this um, incredibly exciting uh, event, Engaging the LGBT Plus Community in Public Service Leadership, Experiences from Local Government and the Police. Um, I'm really, really excited to welcome everybody to this. It's one of the highlights of our LGBT um, History Month events at the, at the university. Um, the event is being hosted in partnership um, between the university and the City of London Police and the Hertfordshire Constabulary. And I'm really um, as delighted, as I say, that we're able to bring together such fantastic speakers um, and panellists for, um, for, our, for our event. Um, this is the final day of our calendar of events at the University for LGBT History Month, where we've hosted over 25 events which have attracted over 500 students, staff, alumni and guests. And I'm really proud to see the Hearts community come together to celebrate uh, diversity, to encourage conversation and drive positive change. My name is Matthew Weirt and I am the Deputy Vice-Chancellor at the University. I'm also in this context the um, uh, Senior LGBT Champion for the University, which is a badge that I wear with enormous pride and it's it's wonderful that we're able to, able to do this. So just to outline the um, event structure for us, um, uh, we're going to have a keynote speech from Carl Austin Bean. Uh, his speech title is going to be from RAF to Mr Gay UK to Lord Mayor of Manchester to LGBT advisor to the Mayor of Greater Manchester. Um, incredibly um, lively um, discussion that's going to be I think afterwards and then there's going to be a panel discussion um, following that um, with Carl with Inspector Steve Allison um, and Temporary Commander Clinton Blackburn and I will uh, introduce those um, colleagues and friends in, in a moment. Um, you're welcome to highlight. Um, you're welcome to submit questions as we go through this event. Um, please use the function on Teams to do that. You can post those questions um, by name, or you can post them anonymously. And when we come to that part of the event, I'll be able to um, put those questions to our esteemed um, panelists and speaker. So I'm just going to um, mention now some uh, key um, key achievements of our speakers and introduce them. So um, Carl Austin Bean, um, OBE DL Deputy Lieutenant, um, he started his career in the RAF and during active service he received awards and recognition for his bravery, including the Royal Humane Society's Award for rescuing a pilot from a Burning Hawk aircraft. He was also mentioned in the Queen's Birthday Honours List in 1996 with a Commander-in-Chief's commendation. In 1997, Carl was dismissed from the RAF as it was deemed that his homosexuality was incompatible with service life. This was a defining moment and since then Carl has dedicated himself to actively engaging diverse LGBTQ plus communities to ensure that all voices are amplified. Carl has found enormous success in a large number of roles including his appointment as the first openly Gay Mayor, Lord Mayor of Manchester in 2016. Um, we also enjoy, uh, joined by Temporary Commander Clinton Blackburn from the City of London Police. Clinton began his career in Bedfordshire Police before joining the City of London Police. He was appointed as the head of the City of London Police's Economic Crime Directorate in August 2020 and he coordinates uh, this response across the UK. He oversees a diverse range of operational units, each focused on complex and specialist needs uh, aspects sorry, of economic crime, including investigations into serious fraud, money laundering, overseas anti-corruption, uh, to name just a few areas he's involved with. He's also co-chair of the National LGBT Plus Police Network. Inspector Steve Allison um, from Hearts Constabulary um, is responsible for managing response policing across the districts of St Albans and Decorum. In, in our county. Steve is also a student at the University of Hertfordshire studying for an MSc in public service management as part of his level seven senior leadership apprenticeship. He is chair of Hearts Police LGBT plus network and co-chair of the Eastern Region LGBT plus net police network and sits on the national board. In recent years, Steve has been successful in making Hertfordshire Constabulary one of the first police services to offer a gender neutral uniform, as well as using the constabulary as a platform for supporting local young transgender people. So I'm really delighted uh, to have 
have them uh, join us uh, today. So what I'm going to do now um, is to invite um, Carl to to join us first to give his um, to give his talk and perhaps say any more opening introductory uh, words that you might want, Carl. You're very, very welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. It's a real privilege and an honour for the university. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, just checking in the cameras on. And you can all hear me. Can hear you. And uh, can you see? Can see. And the script. Uh, brilliant. So, Carlos and Bean, oh, um, I my pronouns are he, him, and his. And this is really just a, a, a brief rundown, really, of, of why I became such a, an LGBT activist um, as, as time's gone on. So really, from a, from a very early age, um, the picture on the where I'm there with the, with Paul and, and Adele, I'm five years old. It's 1977, and it was the the, the Silver Jubilee, and it was around that time, um, whilst I was around about five, six, seven, that that I realised that I was different. And what I mean by that was um, I, I was in the school playground um, and I felt that I wasn't really interested in what, what the, the boy, other boys were doing. I was more interested in what the girls were doing. Uh, I wasn't interested in football. And I had this conversation with my mum at a very early age, around about sort of six, seven years old, to say that I thought I was different. And I wanted her to explain why I, I felt that way. And my mum just sort of said it was a phase I was going through and that it, it, it's normal to sort of feel that way. So I then went through school um, having this feeling and, and, and trying to and questioning myself and also having uh, through secondary school, having uh, a few little relationship type things with, with some of the lads I was at school with. And again, I, I still told my mum and again, she killed, still kept saying it's a thing she was going through. Anyway, so I grew up mainly in the, the sort of, sort of in the early 80s. And around about sort of 82, 83, when I was leaving uh, primary junior school to go into academy school, um, we had this, this disease that was taking over, uh, HIV and AIDS. Uh, we sort of had the, the, the tombstones, we had the, the, the adverts that scared the hell out of you, really. And I remember sort of the age of sort of 13, 14, thinking that, you know, if, I, if I'm gay, I'm, I'm going to die of this disease. And I didn't want to die. And, it, and HIV and AIDS back then in the 80s, it was it was plastered all over the media. It was the government uh, was, was sort of saying that, you know, that, that we were going to die. It was a, it was a gay disease. And I'd always wanted to get married and have kids and and live, live a normal life. But obviously, because of who I was, that, that wasn't going to happen. Um, and I remember at the age of 14 in 1986, we had uh, the chief constable of, of Greater Manchester at the time. Uh, so James, uh, James Anderton, um, telling us that we were going to die in a cesspit of our own making. And when you've got the chief constable of, of Great, Manchester uh, Great Manchester Police Force saying that and also being backed up by government and all the media, um, it was a horrible place to be. So I, I went in that whole sort of denial of, of being who I could be. Now, I left school at 16. Uh, I got one GCSE in drama. We were the first year of GCSEs. Um, I'm not that academic, uh, but I I tried. Well, I then did a few various jobs. And at the age of 17 and a half, now I'd always wanted to be in the fire service, but at 17 and a half, I went off to see my brother who was in the RAF and he was uh, serving over at Akutiri. And whilst I was there, I so that they had um, a fire service. So I then um, I contacted the, the RAF and I spent 18 months going through the process to be uh, to join up. And thankfully, um, at the age of 19, on the 2nd of April 1991, I managed to, to get into the RAF. Now, I remember having to fill in the paperwork and I was actually asked if, if I was gay. And, I, and they asked me that at the Careers Information Office in Manchester. But rather than ask me in a way that made me sort of feel like I had to be honest, it was it was a, it was just laughed at. It's like, oh, you're not gay, are you? Just sign there. And I remember signing the, the forms. Um, so so I, and, I, and I still have those forms as well that, that says that, you know, I, I knew that it was illegal to, to be gay within the armed forces. 
so I did my basic training at RF Swindabit and what was weird was from, from day one, I loved the Air Force, but also from day one, I knew that I was now living a double treble life at times. Because what happened was, even though I'd, after my basic training, I went to RAF Manston and then to, to RAF Shivner. But right from the start, if I was coming back to Manchester, I'd be coming back to Manchester and I'd be sort of going around sort of Canal Street or I'd be sort of hanging around some, some dodgy places. And, and what I mean by that is I put myself into a lot of a lot of danger, really, at the age of sort of 19 and 20, because when I was in the Air Force, I was having to do what society said was right. And I was trying to get off with girls on a Thursday night when we'd go out and um, and then on a, I, you know, I'd possibly come back at a weekend to, to Manchester. But then because we didn't have dating apps and we didn't have the Internet, we didn't have mobile phones. It was a complete different world back then um, to, to sort of to, to you. So you'd be putting yourself in danger. And, and I did that for many years. Um, but as I say, I, I was living this, this uh, other life. And whilst I was living this other life in the Air Force, I ended up started seeing this girl um, and she fell pregnant. So on my 21st birthday, we we got engaged, but then she had a miscarriage roughly around about three week, three weeks later. So I called the engagement off and sort of tried to sort of push that aside. Now, at the same time, that just before that, in the in the um, in September uh, '92, there'd been an aircraft crash at RAF Chivner. Um, it was a Hawk aircraft, and the aircraft had taken off, and it had basically gone over the the, the runway and then nosedived and crashed straight away on, on impact. The first pilot had ejected. The, the second one had tried to eject, but it came off the runners. And what happened was the, the aircraft, had, it, it was, it, as it had done impact, he tried to pull the ejection seat, uh, but, but, but it just hadn't worked, it had come off the runner. So we got there, I was one of the first people to get there and we knocked down the main flame mass. And then once we realized that someone was still in there, I then got on top of the aircraft, which was still fully armed, it was fueled. There was things flying off it. Uh, the, the, it was intense heat, there were still flames everywhere. Um, managed to get on top and I managed to get the second pilot out. But I do remember, and, it, and it's strange when I talk about it because I can still see his face now because his, fa his mask had melted onto his face and I just remember his pearly white teeth. Uh, the smell of the fumes and also the smell of, of everything burning around me. Um, so I managed to get him out. Unfortunately, he died 11 days later. and. With that, I ended up getting the British Humane Society Bronze Award for Bravery and also for a good show award from the from the RAF. Um, just after that, I managed to get posted and I went off to Belize and it was in Belize where I received my award. And I had a great time again in Belize, but then trying because I was sort of in Central America and I was still trying to sort of hide who I was in, in that time and, and very difficult, even though there was a couple of, of experiences with, with, with other people while I was at Belize, nothing that, that, that could ever, that would ever sort of be, be of anything uh, to talk about. Um, I then came from Belize and then went to RAF Henlow uh, in Bedfordshire and had a brilliant time there. And, and, and part of that, I was doing a lot of work then with, with charities, with, with SAFA, which is the Sailors and Soldiers and Airmen's Association. Um, I then did quite a London Marathon a couple of times to raise money for local charities. So I, I was got right into my secondary duties um, as well. And then I went to uh, RAF Ascension in between uh, here in the Falklands, which was an amazing tour. I did nine months in Ascension Island. And whilst I was out there, I did a lot of work with the Combined Services Entertainment. A lot of the, the locals, I did a lot of uh, fire training and again, um, excelled in, in what I was doing. And I then went to RAF Honington in uh, after I'd done Ascension Island. But in the June of 1996, I received a Commander in Chief's commendation for, for services to the RAF um, as part of the Queen's birthday honours list and due to the, the charity work I'd done. And then in the, in, the, in the November of 1996, I decided that I had to be true to, to myself to, and, and come out properly to, to my family. Because I felt that it was still something that was um, that was bottling up that I needed to be honest and open with. 
so again, I told my mum, again, my mum still believed it was a phase I was going through. Um, but my dad, uh, I told him and my mum said, don't tell your dad because you, you'll get kicked out of the house. And I was like, well, I don't live here, so I'm either going to get kicked out. So I felt it was OK to tell him. So I told him and he it was probably one of the first times he told me he loved me, give me a kiss and just told me, look, son, no one told me how to live my life. I'm not going to tell you how to live yours. Um, and I think that was a turning point because then it made me feel that, OK, I am being a little bit accepted. I remember telling my brother who was in the Air Force and he said to me, whatever you do, don't let anyone know that I know because he would get investigated. So anyway, from um, whilst I was at RAF Hon uh, Honington, I told a few of the lads um, that I was gay and they were fine about it because it was that thing that was about the, the com camaraderie and about the fact that you respected each other and you had so much trust in each other. And the reason why I told them was because as a as working on a, an RAF base, on a section, especially a 24 hour section, we would be sleeping there sometimes. So I told some of them and I took my weight itself away from that situation so that I wasn't sharing a room with them. Um, they didn't care, they, they weren't bothered. They, they were quite happy to, to share that room. And one of the only questions that came out was when I'm at home, when they were at home at the weekend with their girlfriend, um, they could look on the couch, what do I do? And it was very much the case of if I was seeing someone at the time, then very much the same. So that was really the only question. Anyway, in the January of 97, um, my papers had come through, um, which was unheard of. So I was just about to get my promotion. Um, I'd signed up for 22 years. And it was unheard of to, to, to get that in six years because normally you'd have been in nine to 12 years to, to get a promotion, especially within the fire service trade. Uh, but as I say, I had an exemplary service record and I'd achieved quite a few awards and I just got on with everything. I, 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 thoroughly, I thoroughly loved the Air Force. And at the same time, I then just started to see a lad in Manchester um, when I came back to Manchester on, on trips back rather than sort of uh, to and fro in. So I started seeing him. Everything was going OK. And then when my promotion come through, I am getting my posting to Ascent, which was in between Belgium and Holland. And he then contacted the Air Force and told the Air Force that I was gay. And I remember on the 15th of April, 1997, having to go into being called to go to personal services flight, uh, OC admin, uh, the, the Padre, he's a vicar, and um, RAF police were all in the, the room. They just sat me down and SAC Austin, do you have homosexual tendencies? Now I've paused literally for, for a second to sort of think what I was going to say. And that split second also seemed to last for ages because I know that if I'd have said no, they'd have probably just dismissed it and said, thank you very much. Uh, we just had a, someone's made a comment that we needed to ask you. Uh, but at the same time, I then realized I had to be true to myself. And then as they started to ask the question again, uh, I just burst into tears. So I think that answered the question for them. Um, my life changed completely that next second because I could have gone to military prison for six months uh, just for being gay. I was spared it because of the facts I was doing all the work with Safa, uh, because of the awards I'd received and because um, of my exemplary service record, they didn't feel it was in their best interest. But I was given um, a police escort. I was off camp within 15, 20 minutes. I wasn't able to say goodbye to anybody. I literally went to the room. I was given three big boxes, told to put everything in the three boxes um, and they would be sent to a, an address of my choice. Um, I lost my family. Well, I lost my friends. I lost everything. I lost my career. I lost my job. Uh, as something I'd signed up for 22 years and something that I'd loved uh, all within a matter of seconds. And I remember driving out the camp gates and literally pulling into the lay-by that was just down down the road and just sitting there for, for nearly three hours just crying, thinking what am I going to do? Like, you know, how do I explain this? Where, where, where am I going to go? I ended up coming back to, to Manchester and I ended up going through a period uh, of, of writing to, to Tony Blair. I wrote to uh, Graham Stringer, who was my MP. I wrote to the MOD 
and I, and I basically just kept writing to them, asking them why, just because of my sexuality that had no impact on any of the work that I'd been doing, um, made such a difference, considering where we were in society and the fact that, um, you know, how, 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 it, how people can be treated like this. Anyway, unfortunately, on the, on August, uh, in August 97, I received this letter that basically said, you know, because I'd been saying about the fact that, you know, I'm, I'm not a threat, um, but their policy and uh, their concerns on the armed forces was that homosexuality is in the maintenance of operational effectiveness. Uh, it's not a question of moral judgment rather than practical assessment. Um, they also told me that uh, the issue of homosexuality in the armed forces is reviewed through Parliament, so it's the government that made that decision. And the, the bit that hurts the most is in the meantime, in accordance with current policy, homosexuals will continue to be administ administratively discharged. And the reason why I say that is because I'm more offended by the word homosexual than I am with anything else because it's written in a derogatory term against me. And on another record I've got, it, is, it says because I'm a homosexual, I'm incompatible to service life. So that's why I take offence with that word. But I also, that's one of the reasons why I, I it probably built me up to, to be where I am. Um, from that, from then, I ended up, as I say, suspended for six months. I, within that period, I ended up going to work stacking shelves in Asda at night um, because I didn't know what I was supposed to do because um, I'd literally lost everything. But then I applied for, for Greater Manchester Fire Service because it seemed like a natural progression. <clears throat> so I went through the, the, the training for it, you know, to, to, to apply. And I didn't tell them that I was gay, and I certainly didn't tell them that I'd been uh, thrown out of the Air Force because it didn't need, they didn't need to know. So when I got my contract uh, with Great Manchester Fire Service, that was when I told them that I was gay on the, on the day that I joined up. So then I was asked and told not to tell the, the, the recruits because it would have an impact on, on us all because it was a residential course. And there was no gays in the fire service, apparently. Now, I knew there was some gays in the fire service, but we were also told that, um, you know, no, no one no one openly has ever gone into the fire service gay. So I was the first. So I was told not to say anything. And it lasted about three weeks until I could tell people. And then I just told them because I felt that I was I wasn't going from one institution to another. Where I was, yeah, you know, I couldn't be myself. So I told the lads and the lads were fine about it. They, they, they didn't have an issue. Um, the people that had the issue were the people that had been in for sort of 15, 20, 25 years. Um, the officers, they were like, you know, they've never met a gay before. Um, they, they were the sort of comments. And, and I, I was just like, but there are gay people in. They just don't talk about it. Um, so from that, I, I hated it. I really hated the fire service. I did my training um, and I lasted 18 months. And when I was doing the two days, two nights, four off, I was doing a bit of like TV extra work, a bit of promotion work. And I just decided I was gonna leave and set up my own promotion company in 1999. So I actually, I told one of the lads that I was, I was gonna leave and he actually turned around and said to me, look, look don't, don't just leave. What you need to do is go off on the sick after about three months, that they'll call you in because you only get paid for, for six months. So they'll call you in after three months. And what you do is you don't come in, they'll then come to your house. And when they come to your house, just say that someone made a homophobic comment against you. You felt intimidated, you felt that you couldn't go to work, you, it, brought, it made you into depression. And, that, um, and then you'll end up getting a massive payout, they'll give you your pension. Uh, because they don't want that on the record, especially as you're for the first gay fireman. Because what they also did was, because they didn't have any diversity and equality, they just put a husband and wife team who knew someone was gay as the equality and diversity leads. So it was all very, um, it was a very different world back then. But I just decided, no, I was going to leave. I just wanted to leave with my head held high. I tried it, just didn't like it. So I left the fire service after 18 months. And then set up my own promotions company, uh, Oz Promotions, which uh, for those of you who know, like the Metro newspaper, we, we launched that in 1999 with uh, the Manchester News and Guardian Media Group. Um, 
So that, and that was really successful for about 10 years. Um, but in 1999 and 2000, I came across a competition within the gay world. Uh, and it was a competition called Mr. Gay UK. Now, the only people that were, you were portrayed um, and you would see on any sort of media platform was your Larry Grayson's, your Julian Clary's, um, the sort of Sean Tullys that you get today, where it's just uh, someone very camp. Um, and then when you actually saw the gay scene, it was either people very cloned or it was people, Muscle Marys and uh, Mincing Queens, if I, if I can sort of say it in that sort of sense. But I didn't see any representation of normal gays. And what I mean by that is, um, I felt that just because I was gay, I didn't have to fit into into a stereotype. So I've been in the Air Force, obviously. I've been in the fire service. I've done numerous normal jobs. So for me, it was about uh, being representing a normal gay person. So in '99, I became Mr. Gay Manchester, and when I went for the half final heat, I came second overall for Mr. Gay UK. So I went for it again in 2001. But actually, it was a, a phone vote on this occasion, and I actually treated it a bit like a, um, a, a campaign. So I went round to different pride parades because I still believe, and I, and I believe this still now, that you know, if you live in Manchester, Birmingham, London, Brighton, that you know, you've got a vibrant gay scene. But if you lived in, um, you know, if you lived in in, in the back end of, of Bedfordshire, or you know, if you were in like Henlow, or if you're in uh, Staffordshire or anywhere like that, then it was very difficult. Uh, to, to be yourself and, and to be out and to be open and to be treated with respect and treated as a human being. So I went for it again, won Mr Gay Manchester and then won Mr Gay UK in 2001. And I'm still as proud, proud and passionate about it now as I was back then because I do think it's about making sure that, that we're all represented properly um, and also making sure that people have a voice. <clears throat> so after while well, I was Mr. Gay UK, I did a, an article for Attitude magazine and I spoke to Attitude magazine uh, with, with Matthew Todd, uh, for those who know Matthew, he, he was the editor at the time. And I was very passionate about the fact that I, I never have blamed the RAF because, you know, there's that whole thing about people wanting compensation. You know, basically, I, I joined up knowing that it was illegal to be gay um, and I was on Barrow Town. Uh, it, whilst it was still uh, the ruling and, and and that was the rule so you know that that's that was my view and it was the government that were at fault so the RAF picked up on that in 2002 and then we had a meeting uh, to discuss how they could recruit gays and lesbians within the RAF so after quite a few meetings um, and then to get sign off on it in 2004 was the very first time that the Royal Air Force marched in a pride parade now, I'm really pleased that I've got these photographs, but I'm really proud that that happened because whenever you look at any history timeline that the armed forces put out, it always says it was 2008 in London and, and it wasn't, it was 2004 in Manchester. Um, and I think that's what's really important about LGBT History Month is the fact that we make sure if we are going to talk about history, we get the facts right, because otherwise it, it, it sort of gets lost in translation. So moving on from, from that, I then got involved with, uh, with local politics in Manchester because I felt that I was complaining about things. I was finding that I was moaning about the, uh, the state of the, the litter bins overflowing, the state of the canal, uh, cars parking in cycle lanes, just the niff naff and trivia that, that actually gets you and, and, and does your head in on a day-to-day -day basis. So in 2008, I um, put myself forward to stand for, for Burnage in, in South Manchester and I spent nearly two years campaigning to be had a fellow year and in 2010 I lost it, I, I, I lost it, I didn't lose it, it was the Lib Dems had a majority of 1600 but I'd managed to get it and I only lost it by 183. So then I can, continued and in 2011 I managed to, to win with a majority of 2000 uh, to become a Labour, Labour councillor for Burnage in South Manchester. Now. I was really passionate about the fact that it's about localism when it comes to being on the council. You should live in the ward that you represent, uh, and I did all that. But I also, I think that Manchester led the way in the 80s and the early 90s when it came to LGBT equality. 
if you look at like uh, you know Manchester's the birthplace of, of LGBT equality it's also the, where we had the marches for um for section 28 and and it, it led the way uh, very much so and I think it, it lost its way I think uh, at some point so I decided that I wanted to put myself forward to be the lead member for LGBT gay men in Manchester which I managed to achieve but then also whilst I was on the council <clears throat> I, I I remember just looking at this wall and it was the wall with all the past Lord Mayors on and when you looked at it there were all people who've been on the council for 30 35 years they were all aged 65 plus um, they all looked a bit like the fat controller out of Thomas the Tank Engine. Um, and when you looked at it, I was thinking that doesn't that doesn't represent the city. That, you know, if, if, if the Lord Mayor is supposed to be there as the, as the first citizen representing the city, then we need to do something. So I then decided that I was going to put myself forward. And in 2015, um, I lost it by one, one point. Um, the, the person that got it got 200. Sorry, the person that got it got 40, 42 votes, and I got 41. So I felt there was an appetite. So I then spent the next year um, trying to go for it and, and, and building up momentum. And people were like, why do you want to do it? You know, what, what, what's it going to do for you? I was like, it's about bringing the city together. It's about bringing, bringing diversity and equality back to the forefront. So um, on the, uh, in the May 2016, I was elected as Manchester's first ever open the gay Lord Mayor. I was the youngest Lord Mayor at the age of 44. And I, you know, it, it was it was an amazing moment to, to, to achieve because it was breaking down barriers. And the reason why it says Manchester's first openly gay Lord Mayor was because the council themselves didn't want me to promote that. They wanted me to just sort of be Manchester's new Lord Mayor, uh, Carlos de Bain. But, but I felt that we had to get that openly gay in there because of the fact that when you're the first, you need, if you're going to do it, you need to make sure you do it for the best of everybody else. And if I hadn't have said first openly ever gay Lord Mayor, that you could have, you could count that on the Thursday morning after it had been announced that the Mail on Sunday or, or the Express would have run a story that new Lord Mayor of Manchester, gay, shock, porn, horror. Uh, because of the pictures from Mr. Gay UK, I've never done porn, but they, they, but they could have, um, they, could have they could have used the, some of the pictures um, from Mr. Gay UK to try and sort of add uh, to that story so I was completely transparent from, from day one and uh, and throughout that year <clears throat> I worked with all the, the, the charity sector across uh, Manchester and across Greater Manchester in the northwest not just uh, LGBT charities because one thing that, that stuck out from from the minute I was given that position was that I now had the platform to to engage with every walk of life and every community um, and also I think at the first I was thinking that I wouldn't get invited to, to churches, mosques, schools, um, especially if they had a strong um, belief on um, sexual orientation. Uh, but actually it opened up so many doors and normally you do about 350 engagements. But I did with my husband's support, we did a, a 1126 going from schools, going to mosques, um, going to temples. And it was such an honour to be able to sort of talk about your life. I remember there was there was one uh, school that I went to, and it had been organised by the the head girl, who was doing a citizenship uh, badge, <clears throat> and she basically got uh, five members from each of the five form groups uh, to come and listen to my talk. And I was that I asked at the beginning how honest you want to be, and they asked me to be as honest as I could be. So I was. And I spoke about being gay and being kicked out of the RAF. And one of the things that I think shocked them all was the fact that they have ne they never knew it was illegal in their lifetime um, for someone to be gay. And they've never really, because they've also grown up where the majority of them, as, as the last sort of five years or six years have gone, that equal marriage has been there. So, so that, you know, they, they've, they've not had it sort of in that. So that was a ma massive education for them. But there was one lad um, that, that was there and very quiet at first. But then when we got into asking the questions, he, he started to ask the odd question. Um, then we got onto musical theatre. Then it became very sort of obvious that, um, that this lad was probably gay. Um, and didn't really think anything of it. Helped him on the way. We had a brilliant sort of conversation. 
three days later, we got a, a message to the Lord Mayor's office to say that I'd been into the school and that this lad, uh, his mum and dad, were going through a divorce. And they were going through a divorce because of the fact that the father couldn't accept the son was gay. Um, and this lad had gone home to tell his mum and dad the fact that we've just had the Lord Mayor in with his husband um, to talk to us and about, you know, it is okay to be gay. And it then made him ask his dad why his dad thought that he was a freak um, because of the fact that they were getting divorced because of the fact of him being gay. So that was, and then they were going to now try and work on their relationship because it had opened their eyes to, to realise that um, it wasn't just you stereotypical people who, who were gay or, or what they perceived people to be gay. So it was, a, it was a, that, that was a massive turning point. And then there was another time in a school where um, it was a primary school. I never mentioned the word gay to, to them at all because I, I didn't think that was my place. I uh, had the whole conversation. And then when we went to questions, the very first question one of the, the, the lads asked me was, uh, what do you feel like to be thrown out of the Air Force just for being gay? I've got two mummies. What's wrong with that? And I just looked at the head teacher and he said, they've all just, if they've Googled you, they've done the homework, and, you know, answer away. So we did. And, it, and, it, and that's it. And it's about the education uh, for, for, for people. And I think that was one thing that highlighted as being Lord Mayor. Another massive sort of uh, thing for me was um, the robes should be red. Uh, but on the day of Manchester Pride to march, the, I, I led the Manchester Pride parade um, with my gown, uh, my robes uh, made like this. It was done uh, for someone. For, it was done for me. Uh, by a charity organisation to give to charity um, and I was, I'm really proud of that, that, that I was able to, to march the Pride Parade wearing that because if we go back just 15 years before that I marched the very same Pride Parade in a pair of white pants and a sash as Mr Gay UK and I think that sort of proves the point of how far we've come on with, with equality, the fact that how, how vibrant and, and how much we've managed to achieve to now be doing the same route but as the as the Lord Mayor, as the first citizen of Manchester, representing 800,000 people um, in, in such a, a beautiful, vibrant city. And then, you know, obviously meeting various people, we met Wills and Kate, met all the uh, people from the voluntary sector, uh, and we had an amazing time. And, and, and I'm proud about that year for everything that we did, everything that we did. And, and throughout the year, as I say, it was all about uh, fighting for the rights of LGBTQ plus equality. And, and, and that year, you know, the amount of people that, that still contact me now about things that I've done in that year, um, I think is testament that we, we managed to achieve something. We did. We managed to, to achieve that, to, to raise the profile. Anyway, after that, I went back onto the council for, for a year, but then came off the council. Um, I was deselected by, by the Labour Party um, in Manchester, in my, my local area, because um, I wasn't over um over keen on Jeremy Corbyn um, and I made that, that that point quite clear that I thought you know policies were great but just never deliverable um and it was I was uh I was deselected by the momentum group of uh, of labor which is fine because I think it just it gave me more opportunity to do other things uh, in 2018 I received an honorary doctorate from Bolton University for my services to LGBTQ plus equality across Greater Manchester and at the same time, um, I'd been working with the LGBT Foundation in Manchester to look at the Greater Manchester LGBT Action Plan before um, before we had a national government action plan. Greater Manchester came up with one, working with members of the you know the third sector, the private sector, uh, public sector, the fire service, the police, to look at where we we've got inequalities and what we should be doing for for our community, our LGBTQ plus community in Greater Manchester. So I, I was part of the, when we were working on that, it took about 12 months to, to, to bring it all together uh, and bring a lot of stakeholders in. Um, but then at the same time, um, no one was going to actually deliver on it. Um, and Andy Burnham, who is now the mayor of Greater Manchester, he signed up to it and said, yeah, we'll, we'll work on this. Um, but then Andy asked me if I would be the LGBT advisor um, to him and also to the command authority. And I agreed to do it. But also um, I then pulled a, a group of people from Greater Manchester who uh, all came under the LGBTQ plus umbrella, uh, but also throughout all the communities of the, of the 10 boroughs of Greater Manchester. 
to become advisors to me to give me advice because I know certain things but there's a lot of things that I don't know and I'm you know I'm always the first to ask if I don't know uh, and also the first to, to to sort of admit when I don't know as well so um, and then one of the first things I decided to do is to look at Greater Manchester as, as, a, as, a, as, the, the, as, as a county itself um, and to look at what we've got so what I did was I literally sort of and, I, and this is still work in progress because this will always be work in progress but look at look what services that we've got you know do we have services in Wigan that that we don't have services in Tameside and what why 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 should people be left out and it's about bringing the communities together to look at the inequalities that we've got across Wigan Manchester and one of the things that hit me straight away was we've got a lad who may be 17 in Wigan um, needs to there's no services in Wigan for people who are HIV he had to go to Bolton but to get to Bolton because of the transport network he had to come into Manchester then go from Manchester to Bolton for a 10 minute meeting to then come back to Manchester to go back to Wigan not acceptable um you know that was a three hour round trip um obviously having to pay travel expenses so it's about looking at how we can get the commissions uh, commissioners to look at what what services they can do and also, if we've got people in Wigan that haven't got a service, why don't we send one doctor to Wigan one day a week rather than sending 11 people from Wigan to Bolton? So it's just some of things like that. Um, and then during also with, with the work, I did a lot of work with um, various charities and organisations, uh, one of which was uh, Football versus Homophobia. Um, and this is Altrincham Football Club. And one of the things they did, they managed to uh, have their football kit as a rainbow and it was the first time that this this had actually happened we had to get permission from the fa it took about six months for this to actually come off but they managed to do it during lgbt history month uh, a couple of years ago and the media attention was worldwide on that um because never before has it has it taken place and it's about breaking down that barriers and this you know I, I could sit here and talk to you about my views on the football and, and the fa um, about you know trying to get someone who, who what they should be doing to try and help and support uh, sort of equality in, in sport and there's, there's a lot that, that needs to happen um, and then it's bringing on other other companies as well so talk talk they they sponsored uh, a third kit for 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 one of the sports teams but then when it comes to when it comes to pride season we always get um, organizations rainbow washing as, as we call it now i don't have a problem with it as such as long as it's done for the right reasons you know when you look at like food for barclays especially do do so much you know you know the, the organizations they do so much i know i've put primark there um because you know with with, with primark it's just about trying to make money for, for themselves because you know the items that they, that they probably bought probably cost 20 pence and they're selling it for two uh, you know 10 pound or something but you know is any of that money going back to an lgbt charity for a while it wasn't i think they did something last year um but it's about making sure that uh, that whenever anyone uses the, the 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 rainbow that they use it for the, for the right purpose i know there's been a lot of questions this year because of uh, the nhs with the rainbow and and in a way that was all just blown out of proportion because what happened was um when, when when the badge was worn because the uh, the health secretary wore the badge and it had the rainbow on that it was basically promoting the fact that that the the rainbow badge for the nhs was, was they were trying to promote equality throughout the nhs uh, and obviously it's blown up a little bit much um but do you know what let's just own it together it's, it's about love it's about respect it's about sharing um but then for me i also have a massive thing about um visibility so this is wagamama in manchester and that's about 25 uh, foot long they were told to take it down they wanted to keep it i managed that the council told them to take it down planning told them to take it down we managed to sort of get them to keep it up because my view on that is the fact that permanent visibility is permanent acceptance and and the longer that can stay there and they've actually got a table as well that you can sit on a rainbow table and profits from the money that people pay that go off that table go to the george house trust to support people with hiv and aids and and i think permanent visibility is is vital um it raises awareness but also it, it it opens up debate and also opens up education for people when people ask what why why they've got a rainbow you can go into the story with it so that's some of the work that i've been i've been working on and then in the uh, november 2019 
I got gazetted, which means that um, you, you get awarded uh, something from the sovereign. And I was I was made a deputy lieutenant of, of Greater Manchester. Uh, again, very proud of this. There's about 70 of us across Greater Manchester. And when we've got like 2.8 million people um, across Greater Manchester, I think it's really important because you're there to, to, to represent the sovereign and also to carry out citizenship ceremonies but also to, to raise the profile of, of, uh, of the Lord Lieutenancy Office as well. And to make sure that, you know, when honours get announced as well and to support charities and organisations. And talking about that, um, in, the, in the New Year's Honours List 2020, I was awarded uh, the OBE for my services to charity, the, uh, the LGBTQ plus community, and also to communities across Greater Manchester. And I'm really proud about that um, for, for more reasons and one of the main reasons is because I couldn't have achieved it without the support I've been given by various organizations and charities over the years and I mean this has been you know it's, it's like 45 sort of years 46 years of, of work because of the work that I've done with various charities for, for Alzheimer's uh, for, for HIV and AIDS over in Africa and also the work that I've done over here but it's it's in recognition of the people that supported me and also just left me to my own devices and just let me get on with things. Um, I've been very lucky in that in that regard that um, I am left to my own devices in, in, in a lot of ways and just sort of left to run with it and, and, and to just sort of make sure that I, I deliver the best that I can possibly do. Um, this last 12 months, as we know, has been really, really difficult for, for people within the LGBTQ plus community, as well as, you know, as well as everybody really. Um, but there's still a lot of work to do. Um, I'm happy uh, that we're in a much better place. You'll have seen last week that the um, uh, government have now given back um, veterans the, the, the medals that had taken off them. Um, at the same time, you know, it, it's annoying it took 21 years for that to happen. You know, the ban for uh, equality within the armed forces got lifted on the, 20, uh, the 12th of January 2000. It took till last year for the apology and it's taken another year for, for the medals and there's a lot of work to be done and I'm, I'm with another charity as well called Fighting With Pride and we're looking at how LGBT veterans can be welcomed back into the, to the armed forces family. So there's still a lot of work to be done, um, still a lot we can talk about so but I think I'll, I'll hand over to, to yourselves now for questions and I'm more than happy to, 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 to follow on the, the way that the rest of this uh, event is taking place. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much. A oh, bit of echo there, but I hope that's gone now. Um, Carl, thank you so much for that for that inspirational um, talk. I mean, I think what I took from that and before I go on to what we'll do next is a couple of things. One is is how important visibility, um, active open visibility and role modelling is um, and how that contributes to um, the way we understand public service um, in this country. And, and it's absolutely uh, inspirational to me to see the way in which you've managed to um, use, if you like, that sort of private sector, kind of, um, if you like, the, the Mr. Gay UK stuff and the charitable work that you've been involved in and connecting that through to the public service and the advocacy work that you've, you've been doing um, for the community over the last years. Um, I was also very struck by the Wagamama point because one of the things we learned from Black History Month and also as we move into LGBT History Month this this month is the importance of ensuring enduring structural impact of of individual events and it, and it's really brilliant to see that you've um, you've been taking that on board up in Manchester and I was delighted to hear you mention George House Trust who I've done a lot of um, HIV advocacy work for in the past and it's really nice to hear their name mentioned again. Um, so um, I've got um, a little bit of work to do now to sort of coordinate the rest of rest of the event. So what I wanted to do first of all is just to remind everybody here um, that we couldn't have done this without the support and collaboration and, um, of the City of London Police and the Hertfordshire Constabulary. So I really want to thank them before before I bring in um, a couple of other speakers um, to us uh, at this point. Um, and I'm going to start and we'll be able to come back to Carl um, in a while. I've got three kind of questions that I want to sort of open this up with. 
and I'm going to start with um, uh, Clinton and, and Clinton, perhaps I'll rather than hearing my voice too much, perhaps you'd like to, um, before you answer the question, sort of introduce yourself again as a summary to, to our colleagues. Um, as co-chair of the National LGBT Police Network, could you please tell us a bit about the role of the network um, and why it was set up, what the priorities are and how those will have a positive impact on the community and why there's a need for diversity within policing from your perspective? Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Um, so, yeah, I mean, by, by all means, I'm going to just give a quick introduction to, to myself. Uh, my name is uh, Clinton Blackburn, as already Matthew's already in, earlier introduced me. I'm a temporary um, commander with the City of London Police. Uh, for those of you, I think you're obviously based in Hertfordshire, uh, kind of the rank equivalent in terms of Hertfordshire Constabulary would be Assistant Chief Constable because we've got a sort of funny sort of difference in ranks going on between sort of London forces and uh, local forces. Um, funnily enough, I um, just listened to Carl talk. I actually uh, joined policing back in uh, 1992 and um, I've seen some huge changes. And funnily enough, I worked on the area that uh, uh, Carl was based at uh, where RAF Henlow was. Uh, and I look back on policing, it was a very, very different time back in the, the 90s. And listening to, again, what Carl sort of kind of went through was probably similar for those in policing. but. Why I'm really pleased to say now it is such a vastly different place. You just would not almost recognise it, and as you'd expect, you know, like 29 years later. But in terms of um, uh, the the LGBT National Network, uh, basically up until about 2014, we had something called the Gay Police Association that existed across policing. Pretty much, uh, it was quite metropolitan police centric, so very London centric, quite bit of a boys club, I think, to some extent. And when that came to an end back in 2014, the kind of gap in policing was quite felt quite quickly. And I think people felt that LGBT issues were kind of starting to sort of gather dust on, on, on the shelf and other areas of uh, protected characteristics, if you like, were starting to, to gain momentum. So there was a number of people that came to, together back in those days and recreated what they felt was missing, um, but in a slightly different way less probably militant if you like probably more sort of around influencing and we created the national lgbt plus network and the idea behind that is it, it represents kind of all forces across england wales northern ireland uh, and it's kind of almost like a network for the networks that exist in each of the individual 43 forces and um, what that does is comes together quarterly uh, with regional leads. Um, Steve, obviously, you'll hear from later, is also one of those for, for the region that you, you're, you're based in, in Hertfordshire. But one of the things that we were really keen to, to do is actually have some real tangible outcomes. So whilst it's really important to listen to the work that's going on across the country, and, and there's some fantastic work going on at that, what we wanted to do is really create some tangible things that would make a difference to LGBT uh, communities across the country. So you'll find that each of the regional leads will have a, an area of or have a tangible thing, if you like, uh, a theme that they will lead on. So some will have youth engagement, um, some may have LGBT domestic abuse or sexual violence, others may have mentoring. So we're trying to create pieces of work, if you like, on a grand scale and then obviously sort of distribute that across policing across the whole of the country to bring in some sort of standard responses, if you like, from policing with the community or the LGBT um, community. Sorry, Matthew, you had probably a number of quick questions you had, I think, for me. I think you probably listed them. Did you want to just shout out the next question and I'll sort of move into that? Yes, yeah, sorry. Um, yes, um, there's a lot there um, that you've you've covered for us um, in, I, I'm not sure whether people can see me on the screen yet. Um, now, I, now I can see I'm live. Yeah, there were quite a few um, points there and you've given some really good um, some really good uh, sort of answers to those. Um, I suppose there was, um, I don't know whether you want to um, explore a little bit more about the significance of diversity in policing. I'm particularly interested in this in terms of, um, and the positive impact that that diversity might have on the LGBT communities, yeah. Yeah, I, mean, I think <coughs> policing, as I say, when I joined in 1992, yeah. is a very different place and it's come on tr tremendously, and I think rightly so. And, I think, you know, at the end of the day, if you come back to sort of, sort of Robert Pill, um, the, the, the principles around, you know, the police being the public and the public being the police. I think if you look at policing across the board, um, it's often referred to as 
uh, sort of some of the senior ranks, male, stale and pale, if, if, if you like, and obviously that, that lack of visible diversity has been absent for, for many years. What, what I can say though now, probably certainly in the 29 years that I've been doing this job, that there is a massive, massive drive around um, creating diverse workforces, and rightly so. It's 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 been long overdue, and as much as police forces have kind of tried to recruit, ultimately sometimes if you've got that sort of older cohort of a, what I've just described, male stand and pale, probably not the best description. But if you've often had this kind of those sort of same groups picking the next sort of next leadership, if you like, but things have massively changed now. And with the recruitment of the 20,000 officers, one of the huge drives that we've got around that is around picking up more diversity. And it's really important. I mean, I've seen it over the years as a, as a detective. I've seen it um, in a number of, you know, quite serious and significant investigations, especially around serial rapes, for example, where until you've interjected within the investigation team, LGBT liaison officers, you've not really found out what's really sometimes gone on um, and really improved the quality of evidence. So it's really about making sure that policing has a real deep understanding of diverse issues across all spectrums, not just LGBT. Um, I think internally as well, you know, for the for the community to start increasing the recruitment, it comes back to that old line about if you can't see yourself, you can't be yourself. Uh, and what we're trying to do is create an environment where people very much can do that. And, and as I say, I look back at my first 10 years of policing and I, I really very nearly left the, the police um, because I didn't think there was a place for me. But absolutely now, as somebody that works in it, and I'm sure Steve will tell you the same, there very much is a place in policing for anybody and everybody from whatever work, you know, from whatever background you come from. Um, but it's really important that we get people to to join policing from the various communities so they, we therefore then start to understand the needs of each community better. Um, and as a result, I think when we get that bit right, we'll start to see improved reporting coming from those communities as the trust increases with it. That's a brilliant, brilliant answer. I mean, just one very quick follow up, Clinton, since you've um, um, mentioned it. I mean, our experience in higher education, I think this is fair to say, certainly my experience, is that whereas um, the challenges for, and we've heard from Carl, we've heard from you to some extent, for, for gay men, many of us who are still sort of pale and quite old as well, um, is, are different perhaps for um, other, other LGBT community Q members. In other words, those people who are identify as gender non-binary or trans people, that there are still um, significant challenges in ensuring the diversity among the 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 other groups comprised within that LGBT community. Would you say that was a fair observation? And is there anything that you think that can be done in relation to increasing the visibility there? Yeah, and again, I think, you know, policing certainly moved on. I did some research um, a couple of years ago in terms of actually what it was like to be senior in LGBT in policing because certainly those are sort of my sort of cohort will have come from the times where it was not so easy versus people that join policing now and you know won't have ever seen that. I think um, for gay women I think they've felt long felt quite comfortable in policing I think for gay men I think it's sort of just somewhere behind um, that feeling but certainly I think for people that are bisexual and trans I think there are still significant challenges um, and actually you know we see this just recently with the national LGBT um, Twitter account, for example, the second you start to move on to uh, trans issues, you know, the trolls come out, you know, they, they can make people feel really very quite uncomfortable and unwelcome very, very quickly. I think, you know, policing again, as we've done a huge amount around trying to make it much more inclusive. For example, uh, about a year ago, we brought out the trans toolkit to, to, to aid those that wanted to transition uh, in police and again, to make sure that that understanding and support was there. So we're, do, we're doing lots around the areas that where we think there are gaps, you know, intersexuality. Um, I think what, what I would say is that there's a much, much deeper understanding of all of the different various elements to LGBT and the various issues that come with it. And we're working really hard um, to make sure it's one understood and two actually then implemented across policing. But as I say, I, I'm really pleased to sort of come towards the end of my career, actually seeing this change and actually people meaning it and actually really delivering it this time. Because I think it will make a massive difference as, as we move forward. Brilliant. Thank you very much. That's really, really heartening to see that you can see that improvement and that it's actively, actively being continued. I wonder whether I could just move on now to um, Steve, to Inspector Steve Allison. Um, and can I remind uh, people watching um, at home um, 
that you can put your questions into the live chat and um, we'll try and get to as many of those as possible. Hi Steve, good to see you. Um, uh, in 2019, um, the Prime Minister pledged to increase the number of police officers in England and Wales over a three year period as, as chair of the LGBT network at Hertfordshire Constabulary. I wonder whether you could tell us about the recruitment approaches you're adopting uh, to support the government's commitment um, and how you've ensured that diversification is incorporated into this strategy and the importance and value of, of doing that. I'd be really interested to hear your insights into that. Uh, thank you, Matthew. And um, first of all, um, just a big hello from me. Um, happy uh, LGBT History Month, everyone. Um, as it's been introduced, my name is uh, Steve Allison and I'm a serving inspector for uh, Hertfordshire Constabulary. Um, I also happen to be a student at the University of Hertfordshire and currently on the Senior Leader Degree Apprenticeship Programme for Public Services Management. Uh, hopefully some of you out there are on the same programme as well. Um, my full time job is that I'm a response policing inspector covering the districts of St Albans and Decorum here in Hertfordshire. Uh, but alongside of that, I actually volunteer to chair an organisation that's called the Hearts Police LGBT Network, that is a group of um, mainly LGBT employees uh, that aim to work with the constabulary to make sure we become a truly inclusive organisation for our employees, but also to help bridge the gap between the LGBT community here in Hertfordshire and the constabulary. Um, as for myself, um, I unlike some of the speakers here, have always been out in my sexuality um, since joining the constabulary. Uh, it certainly was something that I did consider before going into policing, but I am still relatively new in my career. I have been here just under 10 years um, uh, and I always have been. And um, personally, I have always felt very supported uh, and I have always felt that I have been as part of an inclusive organisation. But as discussed, I'm well aware that there still are many challenges and steps for us to face as we move forward with certain members of our community. So going back to the question that you asked, um, uh, I'll start with um, the recruitment opportunities that we have nationally and particularly here in Hertfordshire. Um, the Home Office and the Constabulary is very uh, keen to see representation, particularly of protected characteristics, um, improved as we um, across all of the different aspects of policing. Um, certain things that we have done here in Hertfordshire, and it's worth noting that obviously we are currently actively uh, recruiting for police officers and police staff. Um, uh, so, so if anyone is interested, please do get in touch. Um, we've, heavy, uh, we've invested heavily recently in digital marketing campaigns, and um, particularly targeting that at certain groups. Um, and um, we've trained over 108 uh, mentors in force within Hertfordshire that are specifically trained to support candidates. And those mentors come from all different diverse backgrounds. Um, and what we do is we try and match those mentors with people from similar characteristics so we can support them through the application process uh, as they join into the policing as a career. We also have, uh, as along with most forces, a, a dedicated positive action recruitment team um, that uh, acts as role models really to help us reach out to people that wouldn't necessarily consider policing as a career for them or, or maybe still hold some biases um, that what they might think policing is like. So they, they work very hard to encourage people to apply and come and join us uh, and help us in our, our journey to, to really keep people safe here in heart. Um, around ensuring that diversica diversification is incorporated, um, for me, and I think for most of us, it really is, and I know this has been mentioned, uh, vitally important that we reflect uh, the communities that we serve. Um, it's in the UK, we police by consent, um, as has been mentioned. Um, so we really do need to make sure that our communities trust us and support us. And to do that, we have to reflect them to help us to keep them safe. That's really, really important. So we do obviously monitor data here in force to make sure that we're achieving the uh, achieving our aims. Uh, we make sure that we are on our journey to fully representing the community in Hertfordshire. We don't quite yet, but we're certainly on that journey and succeeding as we move forwards. And actually in the next month or two, we will have more police officers in Hertfordshire that we have ever had in the history of Hertfordshire Constabulary, which is really exciting uh, and mainly due to that home office increase. Another big part of us is around focusing on retention. So making sure when people join us and um, that they do feel valued 
uh, and supported and want to remain within policing and uh, particularly remain within Hertfordshire. Um, so we do that through a range of supportive development programmes, ensuring people have opportunities of promotion uh, and personal, personal continuing professional development. And we also do that through the organisation that I uh, look after, and that's through the staff support networks. So we do a lot of work to make sure our LGBT uh, plus employees feel welcomed, feel valued uh, and do uh, different projects and programmes for them with the ultimate aim of making sure that um, all employees do bring their authentic selves to the workplace. Because we do know that when people can be open and honest, particularly about their sexuality and what's happening at home, people will work harder. Uh, for us and will work harder for the communities of Hertfordshire and that's really really important. Wow yeah what an what a lovely answer it sounds so fun um, yeah fantastic answer I think I'm live again now thank you very much for that Steve that's um, um, really 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 good to hear and um, it, as you say that policing by consent it goes back to what Clinton was saying about everybody seeing themselves in the services that are there to support them in the, in their lives and it, and it's really great to see that there's been such active work being done by I think it's a bit of uh, feedback there so I'm not quite sure what that is might be if you've got your if people have still got their um uh microphones on they might want to turn those off just for a moment um I'll, we'll be coming back to you Steve and Clinton in a in a minute um I just want to um finally just ask before I come back to some questions that come in from our audience um, a question to to Carl. Again, Carl, thank you so much for sharing your journey and your experience with us. Um, I just wonder whether um, as LGBT advisor, and this follows on more generally, I suppose, from the kind of public service and police work um, that we've been hearing about from, from other colleagues. Um, uh, what distance do we still have to travel, do you think, to ensure a more diverse representation in public service leadership generally? I guess both in local and and central government based on your experience i think i think for me i think one of the things that sort of stands out is the fact that we need more collaboration um there's a lot of work within the private sector that, that's already being done that that isn't being picked up by the third sector or the or the public sector and 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 they're all coming out in, in different ways and and i think more, more more has happened over the years with different sort of staff networks and, and different organizations um, where they've managed to sort of, where, where there is sort of a lot more collaboration. So I think that that's key. Um, but I also think, because there's a lot of best practice and it's about working together. And that's also working with the councils, working with the governments and actually having open dialogue and open conversation uh, and having more of, a, more of a freedom and more of a, of a network. And, you know, there's no point having, there's no point having, having sort of something in place that you think is absolutely amazing and, and you want to sort of keep control of it when you know there's other organisations or there's other groups out there struggling, it's about sharing, it's about, it's about helping people, you know. Um, I suppose it's like a, a bit like having, there's no point having a black book with loads of contact numbers if, if you're not going to share those contact numbers to, to, to sort of generate uh, interest, and in, especially when you're doing sort of charity work. So I think that, that's part of the, the main sort of thing on that. And it's like, there's a lot of networks out there. There's a lot of, you know, there's a big thing at the moment about um, uh, ethnic minority groups and, and, the, and the word BAME. And the fact that you know we shouldn't be using the word BAME anymore it should be uh, experienced in racial inequalities and um, but then when you've got all these different networks you have the, the LGBT network as I say people have the BAME network at the moment still then you've got the the women's network then you've got the disabilities network and um, so you, which is great you've got all these but then we need to be realistic where does the black lesbian in a wheelchair go um, for, to, for getting help and support, you know, we're not going to four different networks. So it's about the fact of let's work, working more things together and bringing, bringing our communities together, especially bringing the diverse communities together, because obviously it will be a lot stronger. And that's what I pick up on, on what both uh, 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 Stephen and Clinton said before about the, the, the fact of how people bringing you, you, yourself to work and the fact that if you can bring yourself to work and you're treated with, with that respect, then you're going to give 100%. Um, whereas otherwise you're going to feel that you're left out a little bit. Yeah, I can, I um, just wait for me to come up. Um, don't know that, yeah, no, I, I couldn't, I couldn't agree with you more. It's certainly, you know, um, to the extent that university and higher education is also um, sort of public service um, uh, work at, at some level working in, the, in that sector. I, I know for, for sure that um, 
being myself at work has, has enables me to be happier and more productive in my in my work and it's one of the reasons why role modeling and being um out there is is so important and i also absolutely agree with you about that importance of finding ways to integrate the work of different networks to ensure that the intersection of experiences is fully represented even though that can be procedurally and institutionally sometimes very challenging um, I th I'm, I'm sure you're absolutely right about that. Now we've had a question um, from the audience, which I think is a really fantastic question. I'm going to put it out there. Um, and uh, the question is, how do the panel, particularly those in the police, but Carl, I'd be really happy to have your contribution as well, feel about the role of, of straight and cisgendered allies, um, allies generally in the workplace, and um, if they consider them to be helpful, um, I'm going to guess that you're going to say yes to that. Um, what advice would you give a potential ally to enable them to be most useful to their local LGBT plus community? Perhaps if I could come to Clinton first on that one and then I'll go to Steve and then back to you, Carl. So thank you. So yeah, really good question. I think, um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, allies are needed. Um, I think, uh, I mean, certainly in, when I look at our own organisation, one of the things that we were just uh, in the process of creating was LGBT allies. Um, but we've made a um, change last year to have them as diversity allies because I think it's a little bit like, as Carl just mentioned, you know, there's so many groups across various groups. I mean, I'm, I, I, I'm dyslexic and gay, so already I cover uh, a couple of groups, and some people could probably put me into the age bracket as well now. So. I think um, it's about just thinking a little bit more openly now, but I think allies are huge and I think they can make a massive difference because I think when I look back on my own career, when there, you know, there were you know, no role models or no allies, it leaves you nowhere to kind of go. And I, I think if, if I'd have seen somebody perhaps uh, senior in policing that was open, I probably wouldn't have transferred forces. I probably wouldn't have looked at t doing a different job. So I think that's why it's really important that we do have allies um, and not, it's just not necessarily just people that come from those communities. You do want allies that don't as well, because I think that also sends a really powerful um, message. So I think sometimes it can be a little bit exhausting for those that come from the specific groups that are trying to champion, champion it, because it's almost like trying to justify it. So allies are massively important and, and I would absolutely urge any organisation that was thinking about whether they have any worth or not would be the answer would be yes. Um, uh, yeah, could I go to Steve now and then and Carl? Um, yes, I think just to concur, I also agree that um, allies are vitally, vitally important um, because um, we probably are still in a bit of a space where there isn't a massive amount of uh, visible LGBT role models within senior ranks. There certainly is some, such as Clinton, um, but there certainly is some space there for development. So to have people, particularly from senior ranks, that are allies is really important. Um, the one thing that I think is worth noting is if you are considering uh, becoming an ally is, is particularly around visibility um, because it's great to just say you're an ally or to attend a training day but you really then need to be visible and you can do that in many different ways even if it just means wearing a lanard changing a lanard or wearing a pin badge through history month or wearing the pin badge of your organization's support network that makes a real difference um, because people will clock on to that and people will see that and that's vitally important and attend events you know all of the organizations most organizations hold events for history month as you're doing today from the university of Hertfordshire. be part of them um, and not just about being visible as well but also around your own professional development if you're not from uh, or don't have experience of that different protected characteristics um, get involved for your own developments. You can understand what other people go through and what your colleagues are currently going through. That will help you become a better leader, a better manager and a better person uh, in the workplace when you can really understand uh, uh, what, what everyone has been through and, and what they're doing in the workplace. Um, yeah, great. Um, wise words. Um, yeah, can I just come finally to Carl on this one? And I've got a, a couple more questions to the panel. OK, I think one of the things as well is 
not to read too much into the word allies and get all worked up about it because I think some some networks um, they, they 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 really sort of push on on the word ally and people I think it scares people sometimes because they're thinking they've got to do something but you've not got to do anything other than treat people with respect um, and also the fact that that and, and and don't worry about making mistakes when you're asking questions you know if, if you've got someone non-binary if you've got someone trans and you don't know how you you uh you are uh, how you would address them ask them um i you'll you'll, you'll know that when i first started uh, today i introduced myself with my pronouns now i never used to bother with that but then i, I realized and after a conversation with someone who was trans the fact that just just saying straight away that my pronouns are he him and his if you've got someone in the room who is non-binary or trans then it, it, it makes a massive difference to them um because it's not about the person themselves it's about making everybody else in the room feel comfortable, especially when you're in a meeting. So the fact that, you know, I'm, I, I, I may seem and, and, and be a, as a white cis gay male, um, I could be they then. Um, and it's about having that. And it's about the fact of people feeling comfortable um, to use the pronouns. I use my pronouns in my email signature. Whenever I'm doing any sort of talk, whether or not it's LGBTQ plus or not, uh, I will always use my pronouns. So I think pronouns make a massive difference for people um, and it makes people feel welcome. Um, and, and some of the terminology that people use at, at conferences, um, hey guys, well, not everyone's a guy. Um, it's about thinking about the, the words and the terminology to, to, to make it easy for people. But yeah, going back to the to the allies, um, at the end of the day, you can be an ally for any uh, anybody as long as what we're doing is we're all individuals, we're all human beings and we all just want to be treated with respect. So. Just treating people with respect makes you an ally and makes you support people and also be, be, be in a situation where you can ask questions and don't be scared if you mess up sometimes because it's the only way that we'll, we'll get people to be educated. Um, yeah, very, again, um, waiting for my little life. Yeah, very good, fantastic, um, uh, Carl. Really, really important um, messages, and and I, and I think all of us are on journeys of working out um, how to present ourselves um, throughout our professional um, lives and uh, on our public persona. And I think that it takes people, just as it takes um, time for people to come out as and to whatever they come out to uh, in their identities. Um, addressing some of things like um, pronouns, the um, being open about gender identity and you make a very important point about the fact it's not about you, it's about supporting others is, is a really well made point and I I need to go and uh, amend my email signature after this. It's something I've been meaning to do, but thank you very much for reminding me of the importance of doing that and, and why we should do it. Um, I've got, um, we've got a little bit, we've got about 10 minutes left. Um, there's a question here that I would like to ask all of you. We've, we've touched on some of this um, already. Uh, we've talked about allies and allyship. I'd, I'd really be keen to make sure that before we finish today, um, that you've got an opportunity to um, share with us <clears throat> your key messages to employers. Um, we've got um, employers on this call um, and uh, on in this presentation listening. Um, and, and what would be your key um, message around how they can offer a, a diverse and welcoming workplace? And one example, perhaps, of what you would consider um, best practice with engaging with LGBTQ plus um, communities in their workforce. Um, if I could go back to Clinton. So for me, I think it's quite it's quite simple in that it's um, it's around the, the the leadership within the organisation, and I've worked for you know. Th well, four, across four police forces as I've moved around my career and I've seen enough good, bad and I've seen sort of somewhere in the middle. So I, I, for me, it's always about the leadership and it's always about, the, the you know, it's got to come from the top and they've got to mean it. I think people, uh, or employees will see through it very, very quickly if it's just kind of ticking a box um, leadership around it. And I think it, it ultimately it makes good business sense to, to have that robust and honest belief in creating organizations that are built around equality and inclusion 
um, because it makes such a massive difference and ultimately you're going to get the best of you, from your staff. So for me, it's around the leadership um, and getting it right, creating those environments where the language is right um, and people feel included and they can see. I think Steve, I think, touched on it as well around visibility. There's different ways of doing it. You know, even quite advanced into my career, when I transferred, I still would look at an organisation to see um, did they belong to Stonewall? Did they have any um, connection to anything LGBT? I, I would do that research because I wouldn't want to go and work for an organisation that didn't make it visible. So there's a number of things I think that we that we um, could do to, to 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 encourage that type of uh, environment. Um, great, um, and we've got we've got a question. I'd like to get we've got a question. Thank you very much indeed, Clinton. We've got an. Um, one question in the um, from the audience as well that I'd like to get to before we end. So if um, our other speakers could just respond to that relatively briefly. Um, can I go to Steve again before we um, go to Carl? Uh, yes, of course, I'll, I'll be fairly brief and give you my seven seven top tips for organisations that I, I would recommend. Uh, first of all, and most importantly, is have truly inclusive policies, organisational policies. Make sure they're inclusive of all your employees, uh, particularly for members of the LGBT plus community and also inclusive environments. Have you considered uh, the environments and the places of work? Are you able to offer gender neutral facilities? Uh, and things like that to really make um, not just the place of work, but the policies that affect people there truly inclusive. That's really important and my number one top tip. Uh, number two is we've kind of mentioned, but is very visible role models, particularly important for senior leadership, um, as Clinton's mentioned. Number three, have supportive and well-organised staff support networks. And that's crucial to challenge you as an organisation and to make sure people have an ability um, or people have someone to go to if there is a problem within their organisation that will challenge that on their behalf. That's really important. Uh, number three is the organisation support for key events and dates, um, not just within the LGBT community, um, but with all the different protected characteristics. You know, does your organisation do anything for LGBT History Month? Do you do anything for Pride? And uh, how do you how do you um, portray that in the community? Are, do you do you do press releases? Do you, are you visible? Do you raise a flag? That kind of stuff. Uh, number four, encourage um, a pronoun friendly culture if you can. I know that's already been discussed. Um, uh, next one is to ensure uh, LGBT communities or LGBT employees have access to things like uh, mentoring programs, uh, development and most importantly, promotion processes. And that's that's part of people feeling um, inclusive within their organisation. It's great that they feel included, but they need to be able to develop as well. And do you have those processes in place where they can go for promotion and are able to seek a mentor that is someone that maybe they can relate to that is the same um, protected characteristic from them? Um, and, and lastly, I know it was mentioned as well, but to work with organisations such as Stonewall uh, or inclusive employers to really promote some of the work that you do. And it's great if you do it, but do you promote that to your employees? That's really, really important. Um, and, and people do still look for that. They look at the Stonewall Workplace Equality Index and they look at the Inclusive Employers Index to see those organisations that are putting themselves forward. Great. Uh, that's great. Let's go, um, let's go straight to Carl. Well, that, I mean, that, that was brilliant because obviously, uh, between Clinton and Steve, they've, they've managed to make it very simple for me and, and, and make it easy, with it, especially with them seven points. But one thing I will say about the, um, I, you, you've got to do it because you, you, you've got to do it and not just be a tick box exercise. And I know that we've they've both uh, mentioned Stonewall uh, Equality Index. I'm really sort of, I want to make sure that when people sign up for that Stonewall Equality Index, it's the people who actually work for the organisation that understand what the Stonewall uh, Equality Index is about. Um, it needs to, everyone needs to know it and everyone needs to see it and everyone needs to feel a part of it. It shouldn't just be a document and a piece of paperwork that is done by the Equality and Diversity Officer within the organisation. And it shouldn't just be something that the HR um, team lead on. Because I've been in many, many situations where I've been speaking at events and the first thing they come out with is, you know, we're number seven of the, the Stonewall Equality Index, da, 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 how amazing are we? And then I ask them, so what does it say in there? What, you know, and they've never seen the document. 
Uh, they've never actually, they, they know they've, they've, got, they've got this accreditation because someone's filled it in from HR um, or someone else has filled it in. But I really push the fact that you should have that and, and make it available so that so employees uh, can see what it is because it sounds just like a certificate uh, that you've paid for unless people know um, that you've got it and what's in there and the relevance of why you've got it. Great. Um, oh. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks very much, Cole. Now we've got, as I say, we've got one question I'd love to get to because it's great that we've had um, audience participation. And I'm only going to ask one of you to respond to this because I think we've only got time for, for one response. And that is, um, how do we ensure ample and equitable leadership progression opportunities? Um, uh, but these are provided for all within the community including, for example, I openly and vocal gay women um, who seem far fewer in the most senior of leadership roles. So this is a question um, about um, progression opportunities when you've got a relatively small people of people in these in these uh, communities in, in the workforce. So if I could just perhaps come back to Clinton um, on this one from your experience in, in the police in the City of London um, police, and then I think we'll need to wrap it up. Thank you. I mean, I mean, one of the things obviously we always driving to do is to achieve more diversity, in, in, certainly in the ranks and actually female ranks. Um, we have seen quite a, a, an increase. I mean, certainly when I joined policing, there was hardly any, if any, female chief constables back then. But now, you know, there's quite a significant amount. I think what um, certainly in our organisation, there's a lot of support now for people that come from diverse groups. Um, you know, certainly for going through to the command courses, you can come in as a direct entry um, superintendent, for example, in policing. So you can come from an external organisation and miss the sort of first six ranks, if you, if, if you like. As an organisation, we're doing huge amounts to try and encourage people from different to go up to the various um, ranks. So certainly for females, LGBT, disability, there's a number of courses that they can go on that will help um, give them some support and mentoring. Uh, a number of the forces will run the what we call the he for she campaign now which is about having parity between man and female so one of the things that we're working on at the moment is about trying to set some kind of aspirations again it's down to each force because the 43 different police forces um, are led by separate independent chief constables and police and crime commissioners so they can set their own targets but a lot of forces are now setting specific targets to get um, the various uh, different groups up into the, the the various different ranks that that, that exist. I mean, we have just had the first male chief constable um, to put a tweet out this week, uh, which was obviously a significant achievement. We've had other females, uh, LGBT female chief constables in the past, so we are really driving this act activity. So make sure other organisations, my advice to them would be to make sure you have the processes in place to understand the makeup of your staff um, and look at the various different models that exist around mentoring and supporting people, encouraging them up the various um, up the, the ladder. OK, yeah, thank you very much indeed, Clinton. Again, um, again, wise, wise words, understanding your community, actively attending to the challenges um, that you may have in a particular workforce or a workplace uh, and understanding the different um, barriers that different members of the LGBTQ plus communities may have uh, and, and, and as I say actively attending to those and, and having aspirational targets um, is, is obviously very important. Um, we've, we've come now to the end of our session so I am sure, I, well I'm, I'm guessing I'm absolutely certain that you will have found this as inspirational and as informative and educational as, as I have. And I'd really like to thank Carl, Clinton and Steve for their uh, brilliant contributions. It's been um, eye opening and and really important session, I think, to conclude this LGBT History Month um, at the University of Hertfordshire. And I'm incredibly proud to work at a university which is actively looking to have speakers from diverse communities in our in, in, in as part of our university community where we're all about transforming lives and where uh, equality, diversity and inclusion is now a board level of objective in, in absolutely everything we do. Um, I'd like to once again thank the uh, City of London Police Hertfordshire Constabulary for making this event possible 
and I wish all of you a really um, restful weekend. It's it's sunny in London. I hope it's sunny where you are and that you manage to get some way away, some time away from the screen to stretch your legs and, and enjoy the rest of the day. And thanks ever so much for joining us and really delighted to have welcomed you to the university. So thanks very much. <laughs>